That's right, I feel right at home. <laughs> okay. Here we are again. We're back. Okay, we're back. Barbara Garrity Blake and Lee Crumbacker at his home here in Beaufort on October 23rd. So, Lee, could you just tell me briefly about this neighborhood you live in and how it came to be that so many people live here that worked in the Manhattan industry? How it came to be here, I think somebody came from Harker's Island <clears throat> and first moved here. Mm -hmm. But as much as I know about it, with the exception of the recent history of all the other people moving in and all the families down here were in the Menhaden business. Almost everybody I can think of was in it. And uh, the kids went in it and the grandkids went in it. And uh, from way before I knew anything about it. And uh, that that's the way it started. Everybody down here was just in the Menhaden business. What do you call this neighborhood? Uh, Lennoxville. Mm -hmm. Did it used to be Lewistown? Not that I know of. They did that when they started naming streets. Oh, I was wondering about See? that. Well, the Lewises live back over here, but this is Lewistown Road for some reason. And that's Lennox Point Road or something right over here. They've got it all the way the government usually does. They screw things up, you know. Okay. Instead and of getting it right. <laughs> So when you leave here, you remember when there were more than one factory right here on Lennoxville Road? Yes. How many factories do you remember? There were two here uh -huh. uh, that I can remember. And uh, in the fall when we came out of, the, out of Mississippi, bought the boats up here and we fished out of standard products. I fished out of this plant that used to be over here where this development is. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, at night you could hear them the dump. They dumped fish by hand back then. And you could hear it when it slammed. Every time they slammed the dump, you could hear it nights out of the bedroom window. All night long. All night long. And, uh, of course, the other plant up there, you know, it was sounded like it was right in your face when the wind was right. Depending on where the wind was, it sounded closer or further away, but you could still hear it, you know. And, and what was that factory called? Standard Products. It was owned by uh, Peck Humphreys. Mm -hmm. and, uh, his brother Joe, I guess, probably was in some of that, but Peck was the main boss. And is that because he was from Virginia? Is that why all those Menhaden boats would come down from Virginia? Yeah. All the wooden sweepers came down from the bay, and some of the Gulf boats came up from Mississippi. He had a plant down there. And so uh, he always brought two or three of his boats anyway from down there up here to fish. And so we put fish out right over here. Mm hmm. And uh, Beaufort Fisheries, well, they had their they had their own fleet of boats. Plus, they took in uh, some of Haney's boats, I think, back then when it was Haney. I think maybe they took some of them in. I know later on, in year after Burton got in it and took over Haney, uh, their boats used to come up mm -hmm. and fish out of here, out of our plant. Okay. And when what time of year do the Virginia boats? usually come down here to North Carolina? They used to come in October. Uh, then it got a little bit a little later. They started fishing longer on the bay. And the big runs of fish usually were in like November. Mm -hmm. uh, where it got to be that way. I think it could have been different years ago, years earlier, you know, and then it sort of changed like things do and get maybe got a little later. And the big fish ran offshore. They used to have to fly way offshore to find these big fish. And uh, so they started fishing on little fish, which were closer into the beach. They always ran close in. So they'd go catch them instead of going way off. The planes having to go way offshore, 25, 30 miles, I guess, to find these big fish, these row fish. And, uh, but the plant didn't really want them because there was so much oil in these big fish. And uh, so... You know, whenever they could get them, they they wanted everybody to go out and try to find big fish. But uh, most of the time, most of the time in later years, you know, it was little fish, more than anything. And it's, and sometimes the row shad would come up close too, didn't they? Yeah, they'd come within five miles or so, you know, and they'd always go out there to get them, and they'd mud roll. You could find them easy uh, once they'd do that because they're they're boiling the shells off the bottom when they come around the knuckle, the cape, in that deep water. And, uh, you know, they're, they're hard to handle, but 
that's just part of it and that's the fish they needed that was the money fish the oil mm -hmm. was worth a lot of money and as well as the meal okay so what were the different kinds of shad in a course of a season you know you had your roe shad what else the roe shad came in the fall in the spring of the year they had a what turned i guess into a summer fish we called them nassau gangsters they were coming from the south headed north and they weren't feeding they were moving and a little place of those would shove you corks right to the bottom and i've seen them pull gaffs right out of boats they're pulling so hard 35 40 thousand of them but they were hard to catch they were moving fast they were hard to catch you had to sit way ahead of them or they duck you and then the, because they were on their way somewhere they weren't just feeding along and then when the summer fish started back down then we'd go out there and catch bay leaves they were called some of them you know and uh bay leaves, the, bay leaves you know they're just i guess that came from the size of them you know uh -huh. and why some, the summer call, fish why do they call the others nassau gangsters because they're such hard working fish and uh a big set of them is almost impossible to deal with they'll uh they'll just push the corks right down and go right over the corks and you'll lose a majority of them mm -hmm. if you're not careful they'll tear your rig up they'll they'll pull the gaff out of the boat they'll you know what i mean they'll just tear your rig up and uh they'll you can see their noses are all bloody where they've got their noses they're not like these fish that are dying from no oxygen in noose river these fish are alive and they start pushing on that net and they'll shove it right to the bottom you know and they're just hard working fish but they're menhaden they're menhaden they've got something on their mind though and they're headed somewhere and they've got you know they've got their bags packed as we call it in the fall when they when it's down south when it's time to go home the fish just start heading offshore and one day they're gone hmm. they're there all summer and then one day they're gone it's over and what about hairy backs? Hairy backs come about September, and that's a thread herring. Uh, Menhaden is a called a Bravorchia tyrannus, and uh, I don't know what they call a hairy back, but uh, it's just a it's an oily little herring shad. I mean, it's about all I know about. It. It's got a long thread on its back, and they're real green on their backs. They've got real little bitty scales on them, and they just destroy everything when you catch them. They're hard to handle. They're hard to cook. Uh, the plant is hard to deal with them at the plant. They stop up everything, but they're real oily. So they're a good money fish if you can handle them, and, uh, which we were always able to do down there. We had equipment that was old and worn out, but it was just such a way every, the people down there could handle them. We could handle hairy bikes. <laughs> And uh, we could handle anything. And so the other factories couldn't or didn't want to? No, they couldn't deal with them. Uh -huh. They didn't want them. <laughs> and on the bay, they won't even let them use little marsh nets, and the, which you just about need to do to catch a hairy back. Most of them are smaller fish, you know. Some of them aren't, but uh, the Chesapeake Bay won't allow a, mm -hmm. a six, eight bar net on the boat. They have to use uh, seven, eight bar nets. So, uh, and they didn't even want any of these fish. It just stopped everything up and killed them. So when you say that both for fisheries, that factory could handle it, and some of these other factories couldn't, what made both for fisheries different? We were special. <laughs> we were the best mm -hmm. at everything we did. We didn't look like much, you know, but we had the best people people that had been there since they were 16 years old and they died there that's the way people work there it's not a job it's a way of life and you do it money or no money you do it when you get laid off you're laid off when they call you back you come it's no questions asked it's just the way it is it's just you don't just get laid off at this like's going on now and have to go find a job standing in Walmarts at the door. Do you think I'm going to do that? Nope. Not a chance in hell. It's not going to happen. I've got, I always said I would never have any pride because it, it's not good, but I must have too much. 
well, I've been in this business too long. But my mother's people were in this water business. They were shrimpers, uh, big outside shrimpers. And so I guess, you know, it's just been there. I lived on the river, up North River, all my young life with my grandfather. I had a fishing pier up there right on the river, right on the water. And uh, evidently had some kind of networking experience inside of me that was coming from my mother's people that Levi found. I don't know. Okay, well tell us about that, Lee, because I know you worked in all different sorts of capacities on the Menhaden boats, but then at some point in your career, you started working in the same, same house. Tell us about that. I don't remember exactly what year it was. Uh, I know 1983 was my last year in the Gulf. I came back home and uh, I was channel netting, shrimping, and uh, I was scalloping and things like that, and it got to be so tough that uh, I had met Levi one time through Kathy's daddy, Cap Melmer, and I called him one day. I was having a rough time, and I told him, I said, I need a job. Uh, I can't do this anymore. This and I don't. Levi Beverage. Yeah, I said, I don't know how to mend. You don't know me. I told him who I was, and I said, I need a job. I've had it. And he said, come on down here Monday morning. We need some good young blood in this place. So I went down there and all these old men were standing in there and they hated my guts right off the bat, I could tell, you know. But I wasn't one to let that go. You know me better than that. I, I pushed myself into it on them, you know. And uh, William Harry and these other people, he was hard ass. And ended up being just real good friends with all of them. And in fact, he, after Levi died, William Harry told me one day, he said, you're the best I ever seen, and uh, kind of makes you feel good, you know, when when you've been gotten around people that don't even like you, and then all of a sudden you hear that out of their mouth, you know. And how did Levi teach you? What was his style? His style was fast, and he didn't teach you anything. You had to follow him around and watch him. He he just it wasn't that he didn't want to teach you. He just he didn't know how to slow down teach anything he was way too fast and I just stuck to him like glue and started to pick it up you know and even the cutting I'd hold for him and he'd cut he'd cut a net in two and ten minutes and by the time I was through uh, after a few years I could do it too and uh, I remember one year Bobo bought a, a net in in seven pieces I think laid in the back of the office and we went out there me and him and I said, where are we going, Beth? He said, we're going to go put this net back together. I said, not in a hundred years. Oh, yes, buddy, he said, we're going to do it. And I swear, we went out there, and I watched him start looking at that stuff. And I was watching him, and he'd match up these little tails to the empty places, you know, these knotless nets. And we put that net back together. And then after that, I was positive there was nothing we couldn't do, mm -hmm. nothing. <laughs> and we were walking down the road one day in front of Jewel's office. We headed down to the shore, and Jewel walked out the door, and had a, somebody had a net torn up. And he said, uh, Levi, do you think you all can fix that net? I said, tell him, Bev. I said, if it ain't broke, if we can't fix it, it ain't broke. And Jewel just turned around and walked off, you know. And I have my arm around his shoulder, and we just walked on down there. But I knew we could fix it. If we had done that, what do you... Nothing can get you. He was the best there ever was. I mean, he was the best. He he knew how to hang a net, and uh, exactly how to hang a net. He could make any kind of net. And y'all he... weren't really working with new nets very much, were you? No. What were you working with? Uh, old, worn out junk. Uh, even later on, after we moved out of the old same house up into the, the new one, I guess you'd call it, uh, where that concrete floor almost killed us before we got used to it, we were getting nets out of Virginia pretty cheap, and they'd dip them and send them to us, and and I remember Jewel thinking, these, oh, look at that, it's so beautiful how I got this net for almost nothing, you know, and Levi went out there and grabbed it and tore a hole in it big enough to put that safe through, and made Jewel mad and he and I heard him say look Jewel you can paint them all you want to but when they're rotten they're rotten 
you know and uh i remember i used to tell people you know it, dipping a net doesn't make one strong it keeps it strong ultraviolet light rots everything it touches every body everything it'll pull the nails out the side of your house the ultraviolet light from the sun you can bury this stuff in the ground it'll last a million years light will destroy it in six months brand new stuff that's why you put dip on it uh, I remember telling some guy one time I said dipping a, a worn out net is like putting makeup on an old woman it makes her look better but she's still old you know it doesn't change a thing yeah. and you that's what's People can't understand why their nets get so rotten after a year or so. It's all kind of nets, and you can't get it through their heads. It's, the sun shines on it. you got to cover them up and keep the light off them. Ultraviolet, UV light. Mm -hmm. It's A certain amount of it's good, but too much of it will kill you. Did you ever have brand new nets to work with? Yeah. Jewel let me buy some new webbing to fix a rebuilding net we got on the Mariner the first year we got her she was a rotten it took three days to mend one stretch and I went in there and told him I said I can't do this anymore you're going to throw it away and I uh, can't do that you know I, I said well the salvage is good Jewel if you let me buy new webbing for it I'll rebuild it from one end to the other what is the salvage of a net it's it's 25 marshes of like number 40 or something real Dicker. thick heavy stuff mm -hmm. I'll show you some of it in a minute okay. and it's on the top line and the bottom line mm -hmm. almost like chafing gear mm -hmm. and then your webbing starts there and sews to the top salvage see well the salvage was in good shape it was heavy and the net was already hung so it, it saved a lot of time I still had to strip it all out cut it out from one end to the other and they had that net laced together up there in Maine so I had to take all that apart and re-sew everything. And uh, I bought 23 sections of net and sewed them all together. Sewed them all in that net, piece to piece to piece, and redid the bag and uh, put it on Isle's boat. And it was a, he called it Big Mama. It would just load, it would load that boat in one set. When I got through with it, it was just a shad killer. And uh, I built Bobo a brand new net one year, a little marsh net. I drew up a design on that and carried it to Virginia on the plane to see how uh, uh, Roger, I uh, can't think of his name now up there. Har not Harris, but yeah. Uh, his name gets by me. Anyway, I want him to look at it as opposed to how they hang their nets because I had scales off of their nets, but our nets had to be different they they hang their nets to make a lot of sets out there in the bay every day catch fish well, we didn't make a lot of sets during the year we made sets a few sets and caught a lot of fish in a short period of time so I had to have a net that would catch a lot of fish at one time when he first looked at my scale he said it looks good he said but I think you've got it taken up too much you might have to let it off I said but I said, Mr. Roger, I said, the thing is, I don't need a net to make a lot of, to wire out making sets. This net's going to last a long time. I need a net that'll catch a boatload of fish in one set. Well, That's why I've got it made, drawn up this way. He said, well, according to that, it's perfect. And uh, So you brought a drawing. Well, I drew up a scale. Okay. I drew up a numbered the scale. and all that. Of how far out, because you, you take them up a certain uh, half most of the time 25 fathom on each side of the center of the bag and then you start dropping them off a little bit every five fathom mm -hmm. till you get to a certain point and then you just hang them on out because you, a net won't hang straight in the lines you have to have it taken up some but once you reach a certain point then you just let it run on out the distance of the net mm -hmm. you know and you can't get them too long because if you try to get them too long then they won't fish good the corks will go down on them You've got to have a net that's just long enough. Ours were about 425, 450, something like that. 450 that what? Yards long. Oh. Hung. That was after they were hung. But you've got to remember these nets were taken up half 
20, 50 fathom, mm -hmm. 25 on each side of the center of the bag. They were taken up half. See, that tells you how much webbing was actually in the net. See, how much body, you saw the pictures, mm -hmm. how much that big one instead, they, how much, so they can get out, they've got to have body so they can get out there and blow the net out without pushing the corks down. Mm -hmm. If they're not taken up, then the net's not going to go out like, out like a balloon. It's going to hang straight down, and when the fish hit it, they're going to push the cork straight down and go over it. See, yeah. that's why they used to in the old days. They always corked the net down. We did that when I first started fishing. You got just as many corks as you could get to try to get that take up in the boat. Yeah, like in it. the boat while they were pursing the net. You just mm -hmm. you pulled corks in the boat, mm -hmm. and that's what gave it that take up that we eventually ended up building into the net where you didn't have to do that. Okay, you just. By the time you got that net purse, you had that net in the block and you were webbing on. Uh, when did people, when did y'all figure that out? Well, they had it figured out when I started fishing down south. Mm -hmm. Up here at Beaufort Fisheries, they were still using nets. They had to cork down these inside boats mm -hmm. and their other, their other boats, you know, they were still doing that. Uh, but Standard Products had the best catching nets and Harvey Smith that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. They were small, they were 1,200 marshes deep, but they weren't that big around coming through the block and a, a baby could spread one of them, you know, and they, they'd catch all the fish you wanted. And instead of having these big heavy things like they've got now, they use uh, 12 and 1,500 pound tom weights on to hold them down. And they're, uh, they're using nets in Mississippi 1,500 marshes deep, and they're making them in India which is ridiculous. These people don't know anything about menhaden. Mm -hmm. They're hanging them all in one stretch, which I guess is okay if you've got a place that big to get the tension and everything. But why a shad, like I told you about the Nassau gangsters, a menhaden, an 11 or 1200 pound tom weight is nothing but an accident or a death waiting to happen. When you're pursing the bottom of that net with a 1200 pound piece of lead, and you're standing by that crane and something breaks, your face is gone. Or that line breaks, like it happened down in the Gulf one day, the purse line came out and cut the mate's head off on top of the engine box, just like that, it was gone. A 500 pound tom like they used to use down here will stay on the bottom as good as a 1200 pound tom. If those fish want to knock it off, they'll knock off 2000 as quick as they will 500. You can't build a net with a tom heavy enough to keep those fish from knocking it off the bottom. It won't happen. That's that's. <laughs> these gangsters can knock it off, mm -hmm. and uh, you get too many fish in a net. When you get, you want it to come off. You want that tom to come to the crane when you've got too much weight. That tells you what's going on. Right. You know you can't. You don't want to jam that thing down there until you, something breaks and you kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh. This it's a it's a it's a nasty business if everything doesn't work just right. So that net you built for Bobo, you were new to Beaufort Fisheries? I wasn't new to Beaufort Fisheries. Uh I had just taken over the Sane House. Levi had died. Oh. Uh William Harry got got mad with me over a net. The owl tore up and my son was on the boat mate with him and they he told him to put it up there in a pile and throw it away. Well, I went and looked at it. And I told my son, I said, you bring that net up here this afternoon on the truck and put it in the house. I'm going to look at it. Well, when I came back and they were putting it in there, well, he, he got mad with me because he had told him to throw it away. And I said, well, you can't fix it. I can. And I'm going to fix it. That was the only little marsh net they had. And he got mad and quit. So... I did too. I put it back together and they went on fishing. But that was Bobo's net and they'd given it to Al. So I got Bobo, I drew up him a new net, different size bag, small marsh bag, and I took it up a lot more and it was it was a shad killer. It was just a little shad killer. <laughs> I mean, if you ask him, he'll, he'll tell you the same thing. Uh, it, it was a good net. I was really proud of it because it could have gone the other way and I wouldn't have looked good, you know. Right. You're only as good as your last thing, you know. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so could you just describe briefly what 
what the work was when you worked in the same house or the same loft. You're not building new nets. What are you doing? No, we rarely ever, we never built a new net in there. We just didn't have the facility or the people. Uh, it takes a, a lot of that. So we mainly repaired them. We take them off the, when I first went there, we took them, we walked them off the net reel inside, four of us inside, we walked them off on the dock. And then we walked it back over the reel and the men from the plant would come in and they'd arm load it in there and either stack it in the old Shane house or out the door onto the truck by hand. And then they put a old hydraulic electric motor power block rig on it and we used that until they came up with the rig that you saw we had down there that Don built for us. And uh, when Nadine came to work for me in 97, she and I could, we handled everything by ourselves. We could dip a net by ourselves. We take them, put them on the truck by ourselves. Uh, but she was good as I was. I mean, she was good. You know, we were. That's what it takes. It two good people are better than four mediocre people. You know, and uh, you got to want to do this, or you can't do this. Everybody can't stand there and do this. And we'd stack them in the building, and then we'd pull them down the floor, stretch at a time, open them up, get them straight, and then cut them across and mend all the holes and put a strap around them, pull them down the floor, restack them by hand for years until Don put the power block in the same house for me. And then we had that to do it with because I told him, I said, it's getting to me. Stacking them by hand is killing me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, if you don't get me a power block, you're going to have to get somebody else in a couple of years. I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's telling on me now, you know. But I remember William Harry used to tell me, you better sit down every chance you get, buddy rest yourself. I said, you can't hurt me, William Harry. I work all night and work all day. You sit down. But see, all these old people that we laughed at, they all knew what they were talking about. Because I'm doing the same thing. And nobody wants to listen. Even if you can find a young person to work these days, which is rare, you couldn't find anybody to even go in that business anymore probably you know the younger people that were coming in it to run the plant to work at the plant that were taking the place of the older men they just didn't have it in them there's too much dope there's they're lazy and uh these old men where there was they were overworked and underpaid no matter what anybody ever paid them they were. They knew this business. That's why we were so good down there. We had men that knew this business. They knew what it was supposed to feel like, what it was supposed to smell like, what it, everything. They could just adjust something by ear or smell, or, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean in the processing of the fish? Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, Mr. Zeke ran the presses, and he had cataracts one year. He was an old man. And they, he had cataract surgery. Well, I don't know who it was that went up there turning some of the vials on the stuff and messed up something. And Jules sent them up the North River to get Zeke and bring him down there. Well, they had to lead him in there by hand and got him up there and got his hands on the vials and he straightened the whole mess out. And he couldn't see it. Gosh. You couldn't see up there for steam anyway. You know, these presses and this, you steam cooked them anyway. And uh, that just shows you what they know. You know, that's, that's all gone. And and compared to the other factories, like um, Omega, and I mean, those are pretty modern. That's There's some modern machinery out there. What what was the machinery like at Beaufort Fisheries? It was old, worn out junk. And uh, our new stuff was everybody else's junk. And we'd bring it there and put it in and use it. And some of it was as good or better than ours and some of it wasn't as good as what we had already. I mean our presses were already in such a way that we could handle Harry bikes. When we changed them over and put some new old ones in, we couldn't hardly deal with them as good anymore. Those other ones were just, they were just a certain way. You know, they had worn out this, and Johnny Gordon, Johnny Simpson, he knew that business. He knew how to run that place. He was, he was hard, uh, you know, 
but he knew how to run that plant and he could run those Harry bikes. We never had any problem with them until later years and they ended up having to dump them in the floor and they were in there waist deep and it was a mess, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as these other plants, the people that are that own owns Omega Protein now are not fishermen. They're, they're business people. They're money people. They don't know anything about fishing. You can pour money into something all you want to. They're up there right now. Al and them are coming home early every week because they can't handle the fish they're catching. They're losing so much money, it's pathetic. Just because they can't handle the fish. That never happened at Standard Products when Peck Humphreys had it or down there. We never had boats lay into the dock, even with that antique old place, you know. Uh, down south, you didn't see that happen. They were fishing people that came up in that business as kids. And they knew they just grew up in it and their end of it like we did ours. And it just kept rolling like that until they started dying off and kids started getting away from it. You know, they were, they had the old money and they didn't want anything to do with it. And it started shifting over the way things are done. Yeah. And uh, now we're putting up with a lot of ecological crap over-educated idiots that don't know anything about what they're talking about and you can tell it by the sounds being full of the fish we supposedly made extinct now you can walk to the banks on them they're dying in Noose River by the millions not all because of pollution because of stagnant brackish water it's always been that way it's going to always be that way and the shark situation everybody thought was extinct. Well, if anybody's looked at the internet, they've seen these thousands and thousands of sharks that are coming in that bar after these shad. I don't guess they're extinct, are they? Nope. Um, they're down there digging a hole in the ground where we used to have a scrap shed to clean up the ground in a place where there's nothing but fish meal was ever there. All it did was fertilize the ground. And the environmentalists are making them, which I don't care how much money they had to spend on it. I've lost my home, so they can spend all they want, but it's stupid. There's nothing down there that was ever in the ground to hurt anything. Nothing. What, what are they building there? I guess they're going to put a little village there with homes on one side of the road and shops on the other. I, I, I really don't. A restaurant where the scrap shed is. That's the reason they haven't torn that, the raw boxes, where they, they haven't torn that down yet. But I don't know how far they're planning on tearing that back, but I don't know if they'll ever get the smell out of whatever they leave there. So it'll be like eating in a real plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They'll always know what a shad smells like. Well, they, how did you feel when the factory shut down, Lee? Did it hurt? Mm -hmm. Lost, you know? Man comes in, you place one day and tells you to lock the door and go home. That's what he said. Nadine said, you mean this afternoon? He said, no, I mean right now. I was at lunchtime. Which I was ready for, kind of. Did you know that it was going to be permanent or did he make it sound I like... I did then. The years before when he did that, I knew we'd be coming back. But they had... I think they had reached a stress level. Jewel, Jewel was a good person to work for. He was good to me, always. I got nothing bad to say about him. He was good to everybody. But the, I think the stress level had reached him from water and air quality people. Uh, all the people with living along the water that complained so much about the smell and the, the boats back and forth, they could smell them. And, and uh, even the sport fishermen turned against us, you know, which they, at first, they were no problem, but then they turned on us. And uh, they got a chance to sell it, and they, they got out of it. And uh, it was rough. I mean, it was rough. What was the tipping point? I'm not sure. I, I, I think maybe it got to the point where they couldn't keep up with the environmental 
uh, upgrades. Wasn't there, though, something about the pool ran aground and it was going to be real expensive to repair her? The pool did run aground in in uh, front of town, mm -hmm. but they did fix her. Oh, okay. And she never left the dock again. That was what killed us. And uh, I'm not going to say any more about that because there was a lot said about the man that was running it, but wasn't true. But yeah. you know, the cut shallowed up, and they would they wouldn't dredge it out for us. They dredged it out for Atlantic Veneer when they were bringing logs in here. But when they started bringing sailboats in here and started changing this town into a tourist trap, they anchored sailboats in the middle of the cut where you couldn't even set a net to catch a shrimp night. You can't have the center part of a channel. And you had to have the Coast Guard come and help you get out nights. And they'd, they'd stay there. And it was, it was an intentional thing. Like everything is intentional. You get your foot in the door and you keep opening it wider until you get what you want. And with these people that came in here, they came in here nice enough years ago, but then they started to change when they got a grip on this property. And uh, with them came the money, and with the money came the power. And it, they decided it didn't need to be here. Uh, I guess us either, I don't know. what. This whole country's gotten to a point where the jobs are all going, but the taxes are still going up. So, uh, what do you do? And what about right here in Lennoxville? What are the plans for the surrounding area? I'm not sure. Uh, they've got, we've got a big community up here at Davis Bay. Uh, all of this woods that belongs to Atlantic Veneer across here. At some time, I think they've got a boat basin plan to, to put in. They wouldn't even let us dredge out next to the bulkhead, so get a purse boat next to it. But they're going to let them dig boat basins up in here, and and use their buildings for boat storage. Uh, all the woods back in the blueberry farm has already been surveyed off for big homes. They're kind of putting a squeeze on you, you know, and. Uh, for a, for young people, there's nothing here. Um, it's the ones of us that are old enough to be out of debt, basically, which I'm lucky enough to be. And next year, if they don't blow it up there, uh, I'll start drawing a check. You know, mm -hmm. and it's up. It's still bad because I'd still be down there doing it, pain or no pain. Yeah. Because you know. <laughs> They carry you out of a place like that on a box. It, uh, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. And, uh, you don't leave a place like that. It's not something you retire from. You die at it. I remember some of those old fellows that work like Zeke and maybe his brother. They'd been there 50 years or something. Oh, God, 60 or better. Gosh. Yeah. All of them, there were... It was a it was an amazing place. They were good people. We never had any problem. This racist business you hear about, we never had any of that. You could, people joked around, messed around. It was all fun and games, you know, because it was it was like a big family. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the way it was. So, what do you think is lost now that that place isn't there? A whole way of life is dead and gone. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen when these when these fish finally get so thick and in, inside of these places that they start dying and washing ashore here like they're doing up there, and they will do it. And then they'll wish they had something they don't have anymore because it'll never come back. I mean, never's a long time, but I don't see it. You know, do you? No. It's a. Uh, I guess it started like this in Florida and it came up the coast and it squeezed us and the people from up north. That's the reason Nadine came down here. They were fishermen and they they ran them out of business. So they came this way. We were the only state left with with the right to work. But now that's going away. They're restricting gill nets. They're restricting everything. And you can't make a living out of the water to save your life. Not a decent living. 
just can't do it. Yeah. The Menhaden fishery was the biggest fishery in the world. It was always the biggest saltwater fishery in the entire world. Uh, Alaska's got nothing on us. And uh, that's a hard way to go. I watch it all the time. Wished I could have done it, crabbing. But, you know, but, but what we did was hard too. And people died at it. You know, a lot of people died at it because of one thing or another. Storms, equipment breaking, like I told you, things that break. I knew a boy had it, had his nose torn right off his face when the purse line broke and the snap hit him in the nose. Tore it right off his face. Uh, it was a dangerous business. Uh, working in a plant was dangerous, you know. You could get killed in there. But you did it. That's what you did, and uh, and you did it. Was there a pretty good um, network that stretched from the Gulf on up where you could always hear about what was going on with the boats everywhere? Everybody in this business knew what everybody else was doing. It was almost like we were in one town. I don't know how that is, but it's it, this was before internet. We always knew what everybody else was doing. It was just like a grapevine or something, you know? Uh, they, they're catching shad here or there, and we'd be in the Gulf of Mexico in Texas or somewhere, and uh, you knew what was going on up north or, or around here, you know, when the fish started to move, or Southport or whatever, you know. We had a, a fish in Southport a couple years, so. And, uh, God, it was a big fishery. It would go dry, too, but when it was good, it was really good. I mean, the money to me made there was ridiculous, you know two loads a day and that kind of thing it was just crazy and uh, people down there started to gripe though they started moving in on that and then Oak Island started getting settled over there you know and uh, we went to Raleigh on a bus one time and the head of the Oak Island Sports Association said we had caught all the menhaden and there wasn't any food for the mackerel and I just thought that was a joke until I realized that the people he was talking to weren't laughing they don't know. They think this is all true, you know. Mm -hmm. So instead of checking, we're taking the word from the people that know this business. You'll never know anything except what somebody with money tells you. And it's always the little people that, that suffer, you know. You don't get rich doing this, you know. It's a living. But it's a family thing. You know, he, I didn't want my kid to go in it. It was just natural. He, I was in the river. He was growing up. He was with me. And uh, he was born in Louisiana. And my daughter was born in Mississippi. You know, I mean, God, now I've been around a little bit. And Because uh, you were working just, the factories on the Gulf at the time. I was one of boats down there, you yeah, know. Uh, working yeah, working out of the factories, yeah. yeah. Worked with Harvey Smith first year and then went to Empire the second year with Wallace Boats. and uh, It's all Daybrook down there now. They've got a very high-tech operation down there. They, they still got fish people in their business. They run a very high-end organization. Mm -hmm. Good people. What's it called? Uh, Daybrook. They combined uh, Petru and Wallace. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. They, uh, they use these uh, steam dryers, at some kind of high-tech drying system, high-quality protein. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good. Old, they still got the, they've still got that family-oriented office, you know, personnel that know fishing. And where are they based? What town? Empire. Empire. It's amazing. I don't think people appreciate all the ingenuity that has come to pass in this industry throughout the years. All the inventions. Yeah. Power pressures. We didn't have them up here. And uh, it was like motors and purse boats. When they first put them in purse boats, the captains didn't want them. They said it would scare the fish away. You were still getting the net back by hand, but you ran around the fish with the purse boats instead of rowing. Well, you know it was good. You can imagine the men they had in those boats, you know, rowing. They were real men. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then power blocks came out. And they didn't want those either. Couldn't use them. They wouldn't work. 
until they found out that it was the best thing since toothpaste came in a tube, you know, <laughs> a power block, yeah. getting the net back. And then we we pursed the net by hand on uh, the winches, you know. And then somebody, I think it was Lynn Lowry or John Lowry or somebody, I know they, they came out with the hardening rig first because they used to harden them up by hand alongside and dip them with a braille net. And uh, I think it was Lynn or John one. They were, they were crazy men too, mm -hmm. Virginia men. And they came up with the hardening rig to pull the net up in the map, up in the gaff. And all these things, if you'll stop the pictures you've seen that I've shown you, you can imagine going from back by hand, every one of those things took some weight off of these men. And it got to the point where anybody could do it. I mean, power pursers and now they've even got a wheel on top of the power block that pulls the cords. You don't even have to pull them anymore. You know, I've never used that. Uh, I still had to pull cords when I was doing it. Mm -hmm. But they've got that now. You know, it's, they just keep... In my opinion, their nets are too big in Mississippi, but they're down there fishing. I'm not. Right. I think I could hang a net half the size of theirs to catch just as good as anything they got. But it's, you know, it's progress. Do you ever want to um, jump back in, go down there and see if they need anybody? Nah. I'm 61 years old now. It's, my back hurts. Yeah. My knees hurt. My <laughs> shoulders hurt. <laughs> um, that's it for me. I'm just through with it. What do you think of Beaufort? What's what's happening to this town of Beaufort? It's uh, the... The real estate and the local people, the Chamber of Commerce, all the local people got into it when they found out there was money to be made in real estate and they sold us out. That's what they did. They won't like hearing this, but they sold us out for a dollar. And uh, when they first started coming here, these people from up north, and they started like over on Harker's Island and they had so much land and they had their boats offshore and these people were friendly. They moved down and they so they sold them some land, you know, there was these friendly people. But once they started getting a hold of some of this land, they started fencing it off and they told them they didn't need their boats in front of their house and don't cross my property and it escalated from there. And we've got people down here the same way. That uh I found a paper in the by the gate one morning, one afternoon when I came home from up Davis Bay. And uh, the kids were riding go-karts up there when it was a gravel road and stuff. And it said, we'd like to be good neighbors, but your kids are messing up our road with their go-karts and their four-wheelers, and we'd appreciate it if you'd keep them out of that place up there. Well, how would they expect us to take that? This is ours. It wasn't theirs. We've been here a hundred years. All the people here, not me, but all these people. We grew up and played in that. I mean, I was a kid when I came down here. And uh, I've been married to this girl since I was 19 years old, you know. And uh, and they're going to tell us what we can do? That doesn't work. And so I just jumped on a go-kart and went up there and started doing 360s. <laughs> and uh, one of them stopped me and said, Lee, aren't you a little old for that? I said, you never get too old to have a good time, ever. And I left. But some people don't like being moved in on and told what to do. And that's what they're trying to do down here. Yeah. You know, some of these people are good people. They are. They are good people. Uh -huh. I got one up here, doctor lets me go up there and shoot, but, but some of them aren't worth, they just aren't good people. You know, uh, it's changing. It's just evolving, whatever, progress they call it. And uh, like I heard a woman on the radio on, down in uh, Hilton Head Island, I think, South Carolina, one morning on the radio, she said, the man said, well, the way it sounds to me, you're there now, burn the bridge. She said, that's exactly right. I'm here now, blow the bridge. Well, they got there. They didn't want anybody else to come from where they came from down there to it. And they get here and they turn it into the same bloody hell they had when they left. Yep. And hold it against us. Yeah. But we're tough. 
I'm telling you. And we're not going to be played with. No, I don't think We this... might be out of business, but we're not going to be played with. I don't think this neighborhood's going anywhere. No, I've thrown more than one out of here. I'm not... It's just not going to happen. I just hope people don't get taxed off their property any more than they already are once those big developments go in all around. But the taxes are going up all the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm, at the time, I didn't think so. Now I see how lucky I was to have to be in the military because I've got the VA to fall back on for health. Mm -hmm. But uh, my wife carries Blue Cross on me from when she was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, if she's retired on disability, she's just pretty bad shape. But, but I don't know about that anymore because that's getting ready to go up just mine to $400 a month. And uh, I want to see what they can do for me over there, you know, because what do you do with Yeah, I know. You know? And the taxes on your property keeps going up, but who's buying houses? I can be bought, but when he drives up in my yard, he better have a lot of numbers on the paper because I don't owe anybody anything. I'll build it, and when I sell it, I'm going to be happy. Yeah. Or I'll just keep it. Mm -hmm. You know, I like it. Well, Lee, is there anything else you'd like to add about your whole career and life being in the industry? Well, it was a hard way of life. It started out that way, hard. Uh, at first, I didn't know if I was going to stay in it or not. My father-in-law was a hard man. He was fire, but he, like everybody, he'd laugh at you when he told him your hands hurt, and he'd laugh at you and blow the drop-off whistle. I did the same thing to my son. First boat he went on in Cameron or Abbeville. He called me and said, Daddy, I'm coming home. My hands are bleeding. I said, put a pair of gloves on. You'll be all right. And uh, the captain called me. He said, Lee, David Yates, he said, I've never seen a boy's hands in that kind of shape. I said, put gloves on them. And I told him, I got him on the phone. I said, I don't want you here. Don't come here. There's nothing here for you. I don't want to see you. Put your ass back on that boat. You'll be all right. When I saw him, his hands looked like crowbars, and he never wanted to get out of the business. So it grows on you like a, a barnacle on a pole, you know. And whether you make money or whether you don't make money, you go the next year because that's what you do. And we don't talk about anything else when we're together. In the winter time, we parted as hard as we worked around here. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a good time where we made money or didn't didn't make any difference it was just that was we didn't talk about much of anything else because that was all that we knew to talk about and that's all we wanted to talk about and you can remember every set and when you did it and and all these things you know and uh and the latter part of it for me in the net business i could tell you about every net specifically everyone i knew everyone individually you just you just get to know these things and the man that taught me just I don't know, I hate to say this kind of thing, but he just made me as the best there was. I feel like I'm as good as there was. I just feel that way. I'm probably not, you know, but I think so. I think so, because I know he was the best, and he was the fastest man I ever saw with a knife. Mm -hmm. And I learned all that too, you know. And I've had people tell me, I had a guy come from Virginia, an old man what, come in the same house one day and we were in there working. He said, you're the fastest man I've ever seen with a knife. He said, and I know people that me and Ned up there. And, uh, I had other guys tell me that they wouldn't want to get in trouble with me with a knife, not the way I won. <laughs> but one thing didn't go with the other, you know, is just, and I've been hurt bad, cut my fingers off and things like that, you know, how to sew them back on and, but hell, you get them sewn back on and you wrap them up and and you go back to work. So Levi passed it on to you. Yes, he did. He did. He was he was like a father to me. Mm -hmm. All those old men were like that down there eventually. Yeah. yeah. I helped put them all on the ground. He really? and William Harry Bow. Mm -hmm. Good people. Mm -hmm. Good people. Old, old style good people. Yeah. William Harry was here with the Norwegians. He was Norwegian when they went offshore in boats and caught blackfish by hand. 
He was Norwegian? Deep water. He was of Norwegian descent, yeah. Really? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah, they were good people. It was a, it was a good time. When you said a drop-off... I wouldn't trade it for anything. When you said the drop-off whistle? Yeah, when you got ready, when they came up on a fish to get ready whistle for everybody to get on the stern and get ready, it's two whistles and one whistle is the drop off whistle. Everybody's in the boats and you're dropping off because you're usually, when you're like down south or up here with a fleet, you're racing somebody. And you want your men and I ready and everything's got to go perfect or you'll flip a boat, drown people, everything's got to go clockwork, just, you know. And if you got a good crew, you can do that kind of thing. And your the boat, the steamer is still flying ahead. And you've got boats coming up on you, and you've got to get off, get away, get the net straight, the blocks up, and running. Because they're out to get you. It's a race. It starts in April in Mississippi and Louisiana. And it's a race, like a horse race, until the end of October to see who wins. And it's a cutthroat job. They're the nicest people that you ever met on the land. But when they get on that boat, they're a Jekyll and Hyde. But it's the way you have to be. Yeah. And until you learn that, you suffer. I did the first year I went mate. I had to leave. I couldn't stand being cussed by a man. I wasn't used to cussing my elders. Not back in those days. And it was a mistake. I wasn't hardened to it. I'd only been fishing three years, and the man hired me to go mate because I was such a good worker, and he had seen me in the boat, you know. Because mm -hmm. I'd kill myself at a job. I was raised that way. And I tried to tell him, but he had to have me. And then he got me on there, and his brother he had his brother-in-law on there. I think he wanted him to have the job, and he pushed it. And I quit with a load of fish on the boat and six and a half million fish on the payday. Came home. Because why? Who was cussing who? The captain on the boat. He just, it was 24 hours a day, just catching hell all the time. But what he was doing was putting pressure on me to try to drive me off the boat, you know. Instead of, he couldn't fire me. I was doing my job. We were, we caught everybody. We were four and a half weeks behind them all down there. We caught them and passed them. Hmm. Uh, we pulled the gaff right out of the boat one day on the Atlantic beach on a set of fish. Had to cut the bag out of her and leave it. And uh, he cussed me out over that. I mean, it was, you know, and he was a good guy. I mean, I, I knew him before, but when I got on the boat with him, he just changed. Huh. And I wasn't used to it. I hadn't been there long enough. I'd been with him and he didn't do that, my father-in-law. And uh, it was just different. And it's a way of life you had to get used to. Yeah. You know, and I soon learned when they cuss you, you just cuss them back and you go about your business. There's nothing personal. You just go with it. And you have to get hard. I guess all the captains It's a are hard different. business. Yeah. yeah. And some of them are really nuts. I mean, they're really, if they've got false teeth, they'll spit them out. I mean, you know, they'll just cuss you like a dog, but you got to just let it let it go and you get callous to it and and uh, pretty soon you get that way yourself you know yeah and, and e even in the same house you know you want everything to go just right and mm -hmm. i finally got it that way and had it perfect for a, about seven years and then boom it's gone yeah two of us were doing what five people did before mm. stayed ahead of the game all the time yeah. The other thing I want to ask you, you said walking off a net when you're in the reel. Can you tell me what, what that Yeah, was? they had boards in it around it. The one down there, they left, it still got them in there. So there it is, like a big wooden Ferris wheel. Right. And the net's wrapped up on it. You walk it on there. Oh. Out of the boats. So how do you do that? You put four men up in there. Uh -huh. One on each board. It's like a, a guinea pig cage or whatever it oh, is. Oh, a gerbil wheel. Yeah, yeah. But there's four gerbils in there. <laughs> And you're walking, and you start walking this thing out of the boat, you know, and you're just about climbing those boards to get that net around for a while until you get the weight going, and then it'll kind of help you move it, and you don't know how to go so fast. And winding it on is not so bad as when you take it off that you have to watch it, because when you start walking it off, it's going down on the dock, and it's pulling, and it, you have to keep backed up on it, because if you don't, it'll run away with you, and you've either got to hang on to those boards or you're down there in that net being flopped around in there. And I've seen some of these old men, Mr. George Lewis went down in it one time and he's just hanging onto that board like a squirrel, you know. It went all the way around it? Yeah, yeah. 
but you get that thing starts flying when that bike starts coming down it's heavy and that thing just flies like a little little squirrel cage uh, yeah, you get hurt <laughs> there's there's no part of this business you can't get hurt at I'm telling you I got hit with a snap ring one time up on the bay and just it hung up in the block and hit me in the head I was spreading webbing and knocked me out and busted my head open when I woke up and Captain Meredith was over there and they were all looking at me and I felt something he was grinning and uh, I felt something wet and I felt my face and there was blood all over my face you know my hat was hanging down on my head it was so full of blood and you know what happened I bet you'll get that hair cut off your head now I said is that a damn fact I stood up I said just roll the goddamn block that's all you've got to do I stood right there with the blood flying off my face and I spread that net and him over there laughing he thought that was funny oh. yeah he was a good guy I loved him he didn't he didn't respect the weather too much and he's the one almost got us killed on the land yeah. queen there but but he was a he was a good guy most all of them were you know yeah. they just had their ways but they were they were good it's what made them good fishermen yeah. you know you had to do you had to do this stuff you know you know if he'd have treated me like a baby I'd have acted like one right piss me off that'll make me work yeah that's right you know me everybody's not like that but yeah you uh, know I don't want to be around anybody that won't work not for me I, I can't stand it when I got other people doing it and somebody not and and I don't like saying bad things to people, so I'll kind of bite my tongue until I can't anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like doing that. I want to ask you about one more thing is when um, people would get the row out of the shad. How did that used to work? People used to go in there and get it themselves from the community? Yeah, it used to be way back there. You could go down Front Street and get on the boats. Of course, oh. they waited down here until they could get a place at the dock because we had 100 boats here. And... Uh, Harvey's plant was running, Moorhead's was running, uh, Standard had a Standard and Haney both had a plant over there, and then Standard was running down here, of course Beaufort Fisheries, you know, their boats came down here, and uh, go down and get on the sweepers and break row, and stay right on them as they came up the cut and got next to the dock and break row right in there, because you couldn't get in the raw boxes at Standard, they were big tanks, but at Beaufort Fisheries, they used to shut the plant down and let people get right in the roll boxes and break all the row they wanted. Then they started the plant back up and finished bailing the fish and cooking them. That was nice. Yeah. Um, of course, Mr. Potter said he always had to have a certain amount of row for people to give away to. So they, the, the crew, the company crew, the men that worked at the plant got in there and broke row for him first mm -hmm. before they broke their own. Ah. But everything stopped, and they did that. And after he left and Jewel got it, he, he did it for a while, but he'd still let a few people get in the raw box. But when it started getting, we started becoming compressed by the, I don't know, the OSHA people, tight people, and all this other, you couldn't let them in there. You couldn't let uh, people in there. We did it. We worked there. We could do it and get away with it. But and like just old men from the community could go down there if they wanted? Anybody. People were down there, people were from everywhere were down there coming there and just coming in with buckets. It looked like a party. And uh, they were on the boats, breaking row and in the raw boxes, breaking row and, huh. you know. And they got it for free? Yeah. And that was in the fall of the year? Yeah. Huh. They had the big mammy shed, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't break it enough to hurt them, to hurt the process. No. You can't do it. They've got these fish laid. How many eggs did they lay? I don't know. It's a lot. Yeah. You see it. They go inside and stay a year, year and a half before they come outside. That's why they're up there. And if some of the roast stayed in the fish, it wouldn't hurt the meal or the oil. It wouldn't make any difference. Oh, no. Yeah, it didn't really No, matter. it made it better. God, it was yeah. made it better. And, uh, and these fish were oily because all that was separated. You know, the oil and the water went, was squeezed out of the fish, and the meat fell in the, down in the bottom and went over to the dryers and the water and the oil went into the the oil machines and they spun it and separated the water from the oil because they won't mix you see right. and then they polished it after they got the oil separated then they polished it and then they ran it down and it went in those tanks okay. and the water 
used to go in that big tank over on the other side that used to be the stick water business. Mm -hmm. And then we, after a while, you know, we carried it back outside and dumped how do you, it. How do you polish oil? I don't know. It's those oil machines. They, yeah. there's a certain grade they've got. They've got a, what do they call it? Uh, they've got a silver uh, and a gold. I know up there because Omega makes their own Omega tablets now. That comes from fish oil, yep. Menhaden fish oil, mm -hmm. and a lot of people probably don't even know that. Uh, but they've got different grades of it. And it's according to how much it, it's just it's refined is what okay. it is, and it's called polishing. Hmm. And you can I've seen those old men drink it right out of the pipe. Oh, really? Yeah. Why? Uh, I don't know. They just did. <laughs> like, Not I don't mean by the bottle full, but you know just a little bit, you yeah. know. But and uh, to try Harry back oil was real gold. Uh huh. I remember seeing that it looked like butterscotch. Yeah, and regular fish oil was a different color altogether, uh -huh. you know, but. But Harry back oil looked like looked like just like gold. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was a real high quality stuff. And that's what the men would kind of taste. Hmm. Yeah. How about that? Well, that's all I got, Lee. Anything else? Not all there is. No. Okay. There's always more, but we can talk another time.